Let's get going. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Christian Lada, Secretary Treasurer of the Board and Chair of the Committee on Professional Conduct. <clears throat> Today is our January 25th, 2024 Committee on Professional Conduct meeting. And let's get it started. Do I need this? Okay. <laughs> okay. The CBA has provided the opportunity for the public to participate via the WebEx platform. When we take public comments, we will begin by taking public comment from those individuals attending the meeting here in Sacramento. I will then ask the moderator to open up the lines for public comment. You will be allotted up to five minutes for public comment. I would like to note that CBA member Jacobson is participating via WebEx. There will be no members of the public at his location. Right now, I'd like to establish a quorum. Ms. Reed. Nancy Corrigan. Nancy Corrigan, present. Dan Jacobson. Here. Here. Christian Lotta. Present. Teresa Thompson. Present. And Evangeline Ward. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Reed. Okay, next we will read our mission statement. The CBA's mission is to protect consumers by ensuring only qualified licensees practice public accountancy in accordance with established professional standards. This mission is derived from the statutory requirement that protection of the public shall be the highest priority for the California Board of Accountancy in exercising its licensing, regulatory, and disciplinary functions. Whenever the protection of the public is inconsistent with other interests thought to be promoted, the protection of the public shall be paramount. Okay, let's go ahead and get started with our agenda. Um, item one is public comments for items not on the agenda. Are there any public comments here in Sacramento? Seeing none, web or moderator, are there any public comments? This is the moderator and we've opened up the WebEx Q&A feature to facilitate public comment. If you'd like to make a comment on an item that doesn't appear on the agenda, you can look for the question mark icon, click that, type the word comment and click send, or you may rate, click on the hand icon to raise your hand. Are there any comments on items not on the agenda? I do not see any requests for comment. Shall I close that feature? Yes, thank you, moderator. You're welcome. Moving on to agenda item number two, approve minutes of the November 16th, 2023 Committee on Professional Conduct. Do I have a motion? I would like to make a motion to accept the meeting, the meeting minutes for November 16th, 2023. Thank you, Ms. Ward. Do I have a second? Ms. Corgan. I will second that motion. Thank you. Uh, do we have any member comments? Seeing none, any public comment here in Sacramento? Seeing none, any public comment on WebEx? This is the moderator. If anyone has any comment on the minutes, you may either click on the hand icon to raise your hand or click on the question mark icon, type the word comment and click send. Any comments on the minutes? I do not see any requests for comment. Shall I close that feature? Yes, thank you, moderator. You're welcome. Moving on to agenda item number three, discussion and update on the standards, understanding the requirements to be oh, vote. <laughs> Let's take a step back for a second. Um, yes, Ms. Reed. Nancy Corrigan. Yes. Dan Jacobson. Abstain. Christian Lotta. Yes. Teresa Thompson. Abstain. And Evangeline Ward. Yes. And the motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Reed. Now moving ahead to agenda item three. Apparently I was very excited about that item. Okay, we have a presentation from our licensing chief, Michelle Center, and our information and planning officer, David Hemphill. And I'll just repeat it one more time for the discussion and update on the students understanding the requirements to be a CPA or our SURE CPA project recommendations. Thank you, Chair Lotta. Uh, David and I are going to try and make this really exciting since that is your expectation for this item. 
So, um, the purpose of this agenda item is to provide um, you with an update on the SIRS CPA uh, project and to also receive some guidance for you from you on next steps. At its March 2023 meeting, the board approved the SURE CPA project with the goal of clarifying the educational requirements by implementing solutions that will provide future CPA applicants, educational institutions, professional associations, and other stakeholders with straightforward educational requirements for CPA licensure. SURE CPA is a multi-year project consisting of four phases. The first is information gathering, the second, development and adoption of initiatives, the third, implementation of those initiatives, and the fourth, feedback collection. This agenda item focuses on information collected as part of phase one through an online survey and feedback received at outreach events with students and faculty, as well as begins the conversation on the development of possible initiatives for phase two. The online survey received responses from 556 individuals. 33% of those survey respondents were recent college graduates. 32% were licensed for more than one year. 22% were current, current college students. 10% were non-licensed stakeholders. And 3% were CPAs licensed within the last year. Survey questions were tailored toward individuals based on their proximity to and experience with the licensure process. Three quarters of college students interested in CPA licensure reported using the CBA website to obtain information about educational requirements, and they were also familiar with CBA, CBA educational resources like the exam and licensure quick tips, educational requirements tip sheet, that was almost really bad, and the self-assessment worksheet. <laughs> However, on average, the group rated their understanding of the accounting study and ethics study requirements as about moderate or three out of five. Nearly half of recent college graduates indicated they needed to return to school after completing their bachelor's degree to meet the additional educational requirements, either by enrolling in non-degree programs or completing a master's degree. This group suggested the board provide additional informational materials to clarify the education required for licensure, including videos, in-person transcript review, and lists of sample courses. A frequent request was to provide clarification on the differences between accounting study and accounting subjects. I don't know why that's not crystal clear and to further explain how to identify courses that qualify as ethics study. Most experienced licensees agreed that the educational requirements for licensure adequately prepared them to enter the workplace and that these requirements are important for consumer protection. I'll now hand it over to Information and Planning Officer David Hemphill. Thank you very much. Good morning, members. The CBA participated in three outreach events last year that I would like to tell you about that we conducted to gather more information for the SURE CPA project. We interacted with students and faculty and asked questions similar to those in the online survey. The first event took place in May at California State University San Bernardino. About 60 students attended Beta Alpha Psi's annual spring banquet. After our presentations, we allowed the students to ask questions, and then I posed some questions back to them. We learned that the students generally felt that they understood the educational requirements, although we were asked about what Michelle mentioned, the difference between the 24-unit accounting subjects requirement versus the 20-unit accounting study requirement, among quite a few other questions. About 90% of the students said, after hearing the presentations, that they felt confident with their knowledge of the educational requirements proof that outreach like this works. We followed that up with a series of events at California State Polytechnic University Pomona in September and another event at California State University Sacramento in December. Students told us that their biggest concern is the uncertainty of not knowing how their coursework may satisfy the educational requirements 
and not necessarily a lack of understanding of the requirements themselves. I'll hand it back to Michelle now to fill you in on the discussions we had with some of the faculty down in Pomona. Thank you, David. Um, I'll talk about this. I know at least we had at least one board member attend the faculty session um, that I'll speak to. In conversations with the faculty, staff learned that students often approach their professors first to understand the educational requirements for the CPA exam as well as licensure. During these consultations, faculty frequently use the CBA resources like the educational requirements tip sheet or the self-assessment worksheet, which they find helpful once students have received guidance on how to properly utilize these materials. Despite the positive feedback on the board's existing resources, faculty indicated that students need to be better equipped to understand how their courses fit into the educational requirements. Importantly, faculty reported that contemporary accounting and business curriculum now incorporates ethics concepts in many courses, exposing accounting students to more ethics concepts now than in the past. Faculty supported the possibility of a direct educational track to qualifying for the CPA exam and CPA licensure, suggesting that a master's degree in accounting or tax could satisfy all educational requirements. Before I give you possible initiatives, I want to remind everyone that all of this feedback we gathered was specific to the SURE CPA project which was developed for the specific purpose of addressing the board's educational requirements and is not intended to tackle the larger discussions being held on a national level, some of which may be discussed later in item four. With that, I would like to move on to concepts that could be developed into initiatives for SURE CPA. These can be found on page six of your item. We will offer four concepts and encourage member discussions and input at the conclusion of our presentation. Please keep in mind that the question before the board is not if we should implement these ideas, but instead, should we research them? The first is update outdated course titles. Course titles can be updated to match terminology used in college course catalogs. Cal CPA's Accounting Education Committee is currently conducting preliminary research to assist staff in identifying outdated titles and terminology used in the educational requirements. If the board agrees with pursuing this idea further, once the preliminary information is received, a statewide effort could be made to gather course title information from additional colleges and universities. Once this research is completed, a specific legislative change, regulatory change, or both, both can be proposed. The second is to modify the areas of study. The possible initiative would allow us to revisit and modify the 20-unit accounting study and 10-unit ethics study requirements, which were added when the total unit requirement increased from 120 to 150 semester units. This idea is in response to the confusion surrounding the requirements to meet the accounting subject requirement to sit for the CPA exam compared to the accounting study requirement for CPA licensure and the faculty feedback about ethics curriculum being more broadly included in today's accounting and business courses. If the board will like us, would like us to pursue these ideas, the board may decide to, one, research alternatives that eliminate the accounting study area by redistributing the units across the business related and accounting subject areas while maintaining the 150 unit requirement. This initiative requires additional information gathering before a specific legislative and or regulatory change can be proposed. Two, research whether the board should reduce or eliminate the 10 unit ethics study requirement. As noted by faculty, ethics is being embedded in courses across the accounting curriculum, which was not the case nearly 10 years ago when the legislature originally put the requirement in place. As the board considers this, it may want to balance this with its recent proposal to eliminate the professional ethics for CPAs or PETH examination. Third, Alternatively, and in addition to the ideas proposed in the written agenda item, in other words, I'm going off script, 
research could be done to determine if additional subject areas might be added to those already listed as allowable ethics courses while maintaining the 10 unit requirement. Once data is received following the research, a specific legislative change, regulatory change, or both could be proposed. The third idea is to improve the efficiency of educational review conducted by uh, board staff. If the board wishes to pursue this idea, it would include investigation of whether certain degrees could be considered to automatically qualify an applicant for the CPA exam or for the CPA licensure. For example, the conferral of a master's degree in accounting or taxation could be determined to meet all educational requirements for licensure. Once data is received following the research, a specific legislative change, regulatory change or both, uh, could be proposed. This could um, allay some of the students' concerns about not knowing if all of their coursework will be accepted by the board. The fourth idea is to look toward experiential learning as a means of meeting the 150 unit requirement. The SURE uh, CPA project limited its focus to pathways that require 150 semester units. Examples of experiential learning that fit within the SURE CPA focus include graduates of St. Peter's University in New Jersey that work with uh, PWC to earn 30 units through paid full-time work experience in PWC's Work for Credit program, or NASBA's Experience, Learn, and Earn program, or ELE, that allows students to join participating firms after completing their bachelor's degree and enroll in Tulane University to finish the additional units while earning experience at their firms. Initial review of this pilot program suggests it would meet California's current educational requirements because it results in a college transcript showing 150 units. Other states have introduced or proposed the introduction of legislation that would add a 120 semester unit pathway with a two year experience requirement. It should be noted that these models may not be substantially equivalent given they require fewer than 150 semester units, and the SURE CPA project did not consider these options. Additionally, NASA's Professional Licensure Task Force is currently researching possible new pathways that require only 120 units with the addition of a structured experiential learning component. The task force work will be discussed more in the next CPC item. Before we conclude, I'll let David highlight some of the work we are beginning this year with our outreach materials. Thank you again. We did receive some feedback last year about the need to update and modernize some of our outreach materials. Faculty and students alike told us that one of their most used CBA resources is the Education Requirements Tip Sheet, which is this one that's on the website, and we also bring it with us to our outreach events. The sheet is full of great information, but we're reworking it to make it a little more visually appealing, maybe more graphics, that kind of style, uh, similar to our exam and licensure quick tips, which are going to be updated with the new information as well. Other feedback we received from a number of students was that they wished that the units could automatically total when they enter their courses in our self-assessment worksheet, which is fillable on our website. Staff has begun work to make this happen. Finally, we're in the process of developing a series of web pages dealing with the different paths individuals may take to reach the goal of CPA licensure, such as obtaining a business degree, but then needing to go back and take a few more accounting courses, or making a career change after working in a field other than accounting. We're creating graphics which display these paths where the user will click on the image which most describes them and be taken to a web page with information and resources specific to their situation. This concludes our presentation. I will now turn it back to Chair Lotta for discussion and feedback on the four potential initiatives, and we are happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Center and Mr. Hemphill. I will open things up for discussion from our committee members. Okay, oh, Ms. Corgan. 
Well, um, thank you for that information. It's, it's very helpful, very useful. And kind of my opinion of it is, is that these areas are all very important to be explored, information gathering, so we can use that information to kind of guide us and ultimately the board and ultimately making a decision. Um, I know we're pretty well, I mean, we're at the 150, but we know nationally a lot of considerations are being made. Um, and I think that we need to be open to that, but with the rigors of you know, what it took or what it takes to become a CPA, what the ultimate end goal of quality practicing CPAs in mind. Um, obviously, I don't have enough information to make a decision, as does anyone at this point, but I would encourage staff to continue along these lines. I'm, I'm not opposed to hearing about any of these myself, I don't necessarily have any other ideas to offer you, you know, other um, avenues to explore, um, but but that's kind of where I stand on it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Corgan. Ms. Ward? Um, start off by saying thank you so much. This is a lot of uh, research and work right here. Um, I would just like to add, um, from reading the material, and I teach at the college, for like number one, update outdated course titles. That's a tricky one because I think right now there's a battle going on. They're trying to make the junior colleges, state and UCs have the same exact verbiage and the fight is happening right now. So that might be one where you have to wait a little bit until they get it together, right? Uh, a lot of extra work. But I think having the pathways listed and noted for your students to go onto the website and get the information is wonderful. A lot of students go to counselors and they don't know the answers. So students are frustrated, take the wrong courses, and then figuring out, wasting my time, I can't apply, missing one course. So I think the more material that we can have on the website to give direct information is the best, because colleges will give so many different options that are wrong sometimes. <laughs> Thank you, wonderful work. Thank you, Ms. Ward. Uh, I have a few comments and questions, so bear with me. <laughs> Um, okay, so one of my first questions, you mentioned um, confusion with our candidates regarding accounting study and accounting subjects. What is the current difference or definition of those two things now? I, I wish that was really easy to <laughs> provide you. And I will, I wish, so David handed out this, um, or, or kind of showed this tip sheet. It takes about an inch to describe what accounting subjects are, <laughs> right? It takes three inches to describe accounting study, and it has a lot more complexity in it. There's a lot of language about a minimum of certain things. There's a minimum of accounting subjects, referencing back to that. There's maximum units within that bucket. So that bucket in particular, because of this addition between minimum and maximum, really adds a level of complexity when you're understanding it. There's also an additional complexity that comes along when you are looking at your courses from the point of applying for the exam and then applying for licensure, because you can put those courses in different buckets to meet your needs at one point in time. So when you're applying for the exam, you may put that in uh, accounting subjects. Later, you may put that in something else. So by having those separate, instead of looking at whether there's a way to instead maybe consolidate and have accounting, business, and ethics, um, that's one approach I think would, would lessen the complexity even if we still had to have some minimum and maximum information in there, it would still be contained in a single category. Does that help? Yes, thank you, Ms. Sender. So that's more in line with the um, that first discussion, you bullet point about researching alternatives for redistributing the units. Um, I think I'm in favor of that. I think it has the same results for us, but you know, clarifies things for our candidates. So that's something I think we should research. Um, it seems the most direct way to address 
that issue rather than, um, well, I guess the 10 unit ethics, that's a different item to discuss. Um, but yeah, I'm in favor of any option to consolidate and clarify that as well. Um, any other comments I was having? I'm in agreement with Ms. Corgan. I think all of them are important areas of study. Um, I think I have a couple more comments. Moving on to the education review and efficiency. Um, can we, well, my first question is, do we know how often a, an accounting degree would not meet our requirements? Or is that something staff would need to research? We would need to research that how often. Right now we allow for the masters in accounting to qualify for 20 additional units within that accounting study, but it does not assist you with meeting the ethics. And so that is where sometimes those individuals with a master's degree kind of get caught up in, in that. Um, I only reviewed, uh, I think, two universities looking at their requirements um, just in, in, compared to ours, and none of them have uh, an ethics re require neither of those had an ethics requirement as high as we do um, in order to receive a, a degree. Thank you. Um, I would say I'm in favor of moving towards, um, you know, granting credits automatically for bachelors of accounting. Uh, but I just would want staff to research more to see how often that happens that a bachelor's in accounting is not sufficient. I think with that information, it would be easier to move forward with going in that direction. Ms. Uh, yeah. Corgan? Um, and is it safe for me to assume that we're considering accredited universities? Um, I think we really haven't gotten in the nuts and bolts, but I think that is a, a fair thing for us to make sure that we consider as we do additional research. Okay, I, w I also had a comment regarding the experiential learning. So um, item number four, do we know for states and firms who are doing this, how, how much work equates to a credit hour? Or this is something I think we could research um, in terms of looking into the experiential learning. Um, because just based on the information we have, it seems like we don't have that level of detail, and I think that would be helpful in evaluating any experiential learning programs. Do, do you want me to comment on that? I, we are happy to do that. I think there's a difference, and this is what is really um, confusing when we talk about experiential learning because there's not this single definition. So we have experiential learning that results in college credits, Right, and that would fall within our 150 units. Currently, um, ELE could be considered experiential learning by, because there's no clear definition, as well as the Price Waterhouse Cooper example we provided. And those all result in uh, units. We would accept those units now. So there's nothing that we need to do to change our our pathways to allow for that. What would need to change is if we wanted to take advantage of the conversations that are occurring on the national level regarding experiential learning in, in lieu of 150 units. And that is not something that we focus on in Sure CPA. It, it could be something that we focus on in the future as we bring items before you or we can leave that as a separate item given the national conversation that's occurring. It is something that we, I'm sure, will be uh, discussing um, at the board. Ms. Corgan? Uh, yes, so an important distinction is, is that those units wind up on a transcript. And that makes your jobs very easy, a whole different world. When they don't wind up on the transcript, the tough issue is how do you measure them? What's the equation? I mean, you know, you know, what are they really worth? How do you evaluate them? And that's the tough thing. And when you say the Sure CPA project hadn't considered, <clears throat> pardon me, 
some of this, that's because when you all start, when we all started the Sure CPA project, some of these topics really weren't looming like they are now. And so we'll have to look to what the, <clears throat> what the big guys, what the nationals are doing and working on these projects and working out those definitions and presenting that back to us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Corgan. I agree in light of the national conversation, I think it would be beneficial to expand the scope of SURE CPA to include those considerations going forward. Um, I also had one comment on item three on page five. You mentioned in faculty um, response or feedback that a database of university courses um, and which educational requirements they would satisfy, or satisfy was suggested. It seems like a good solution, but I was curious, is that even feasible? I know, it, it seems like a good solution on its face, but unfortunately it is not a feasible solution. Um, what is included within courses that are even have the same title across the universities are vastly different. Um, and so it would have to be done not at a course title level, but at a university course title level. And those content and courses can change annually. So it really wasn't feasible in our opinion. Thank you. That was my uh, thought, but I just thought I'd ask. Mr. Jacobson. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a, I have a, a, simple, a simple question. question. Perhaps the answer Perhaps isn't. The answer isn't what is the criticism, is the criticism of, of just, just saying, saying that you have to have, have, to have 150, 150 units? units. Just like you have Just to like have 120 units. Yeah. Mr. Jacobson, um, okay, Mr. Franzella is going to answer that one. Um, I, I think the, there's just a lot of national momentum around evaluating the 150, given the fact that they have a significant supply and demand problem for getting CPAs and individuals, uh, some college, uh, recent college graduates, um, individuals who are in college now or seeking it are have at least voiced some concern that the 150 semester units is a barrier to entry and creates a lot of problems in terms of getting that uh, getting that fulfilled. So I think given the CPA pipeline uh, dilemma that the profession is facing, there's a lot of discussion now about either alternatives to the 150, alternatives to creating either sub pathways within the 150, like we're talking about here through experiential learning, uh, experience learn and earn, um, and other models that may come up. But they, as Ms. Corrigan had mentioned, NASBA, and it's in your next agenda item, is exploring um, an alternative that might be a 120 model with another form of experiential learning that can be considered equivalent to 150 semester units without it showing up on the transcript. So I would say that the it's just the tides have turned a bit on the 150 and related to whether or not it is a barrier to entry. And so that's kind of the dialogue uh, that Sure CPA and then the NASBA pipeline are looking at. Thank you, Dominic. I, I, a warning I'd like to uh, present is to be sure, and you probably have this in, in, in your head, but it's really important that we don't dumb down the, the requirements. I, in my profession, in the law profession, in my opinion, we've done that. It, the the bar exam, which was forever a three day exam, became a two day exam. The uh, passing score has been lowered, and now the board of governors of of the uh, 
state bar has asked the Supreme Court to allow for a, a completely different kind of, uh, um, quote, exam, unquote, that really isn't the, the traditional bar exam. And I think a lot of this, from what I can see, comes from pressure from the American Bar Association saying to the law schools, if your if your passage rate goes below a certain percentage, because things have been going down, the passage rates have been going down, then we're going to yank your accreditation. And my hypothesis is that the, the law schools are then putting pressure on the on the uh, 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 on the state bar to frankly make an easier bar exam and and so please be careful that we don't dumb down thank you for your comment mr jacobson any other board member comments Staff, did you receive sufficient guidance and feedback? Was there anything else you needed us to give more thoughts on? No, I think that was helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any public comments here in Sacramento on the item? Okay, we have Mr. Jason Fox from Cal CPA approaching the table. Good morning, Jason Fox with the California Society of CPAs. So Barrett is going to go through a couple of um, comments on the on the items or suggest in the materials. So, so first, we appreciate the staff's um, outreach efforts and inclusion of Cal CPA in those efforts. Um, I think it's been very helpful. Uh, and staff's also been very good about keeping us engaged in the conversation as these concepts take shape. And so uh, we appreciate that. Um, so looking at the ones that were flagged um, on the course titles, uh, yes, we'd agree, you know, there's a needed effort to clean that up. They're definitely stale. I think they were put together uh, almost 15 years ago, uh, you know, through a process. And so a lot has changed in the profession and the academic setting. So um, we would uh, encourage that effort and happy to help with that. Um, and, I, you know, I think there's maybe ways to do it. Um, more evergreen titles or concepts that might uh, prevent having to come back and do this more often. Uh, on the areas of study, uh, similarly, so we agree, you know, this is something that should be considered uh, how classes are bucketed and the different requirements. Again, these were put together almost 15 plus years ago and a lot has changed. And that's historically been an area of confusion for a lot of candidates. Where does this class go? Uh, it seems like it's putting together, a, you know, a jigsaw puzzle sometimes of putting courses in different areas. So I think that's a worthy effort to kind of figure out how that could be uh, expanded, more flexibility, and how uh, classes can be put together. Uh, we would caution, though, of lowering or removing kind of the ethics component. Um, and I, I, it, we've had this conversation with staff. You know, I, I think there's a lot to um, uh, considerations around this kind of the component of ethics just being in there. But we do recognize that ethics is embedded in a lot of different courses already as it's kind of evolved as, a, as the professions change a little bit. So it, it makes sense to think about how courses fit into the ethics bucket uh, and kind of broadening that a little bit. Uh, on the fast track process, we would agree um, looking at degree types is a way to kind of expedite that review process. I know that helps from the staff side, but from a candidate side, it adds more clarity um, and assurance that, you know, if I have a, uh, a degree in accounting, you know, I will meet the requirements. Certainly the, there's some effort to go through to make sure that the average or most accounting degrees would capture the core or most of the, the existing requirements that, that work needs to be done, but I think it's uh, worthy to do that. I, I would make sure that we still keep in mind those candidates that come into the profession without accounting degrees, um, that's a growing number. And so, um, you know, there might be a, an extra level of work that needs to be done to make sure they have their education, but um, you know, 
let's help as much pop of the population we can for some fast track, but we got to help the other folks as well. Uh, you know, on the experiential learning, you know, it is a concept uh, we think is certainly worth continuing and just and broadly as we look at the profession, more flexible ways to uh, meet the 150 or what does that modern licensure framework look like? I think those are conversations that should continue and I, I know there'll be an agenda item later uh, on there. So I, I, I defer to the board, whether it's the scope of the SURE project or an outside that. I, you know, we would be supportive of continuing to have those conversations. I would just caution not jumping into, you know, you know, boxing ourselves in one way or the other as that kind of national conversation occurs. I think that's going to happen uh, over the, the course of this year. And I think we'll start to see some more, um, you know, uh, coalescing around different concepts. Um, not sure what those are, whether it's on the transcript or off the transcript. Those are all important things, uh, but would continue the board or encourage the board to continue to be part of that and explore that. With that, I think I covered them all. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Fox. Any additional committee comments after those? Thank you. Moderator, please open WebEx for public comment. This is the moderator. If anyone would like to make a comment, you may look for the hand icon and click that to raise your hand, or you may look for the question mark icon Click that, type the word comment in the text box and click send. Each speaker will be given five minutes with a 30 second warning. Are there any comments? Uh, we do have a raised hand from someone logged into WebEx as John Stuller. John, I'm going to send you a request to unmute your microphone and you'll have five minutes. You're unmuted. Listening to my comment. Uh, I've been hearing a lot of um, common discussion about the ethics and the 150 uh, requirements and the exam requirements, but I also want members to be aware of changes that need to happen to the experience requirement, particularly for those CPA candidates that want to obtain licensure through private industry uh, or solo practitioners that want to work. Um, currently, the current model is you must work under a direct supervisor that's actively licensed. Um, and, and there is some discrepancy that that seems to be an administrative policy where the, the business code, professional code 5093, does not use the term active. It just says licensed CPA. Um, and in many states, any CPA can verify the work experience requirement. NASBA even has a CPA verification service uh, that um, where they interview candidates and I have used this service. Um, so at some point I would like to, an, an agenda item to be added to discuss uh, refinements to the experience requirements, particularly for those older candidates who've worked in industry and not necessarily have worked directly under a CPA that's been active because um, many CPAs in industry have their license, but then don't maintain it due to cost or CP requirements. But there is a need to have the CPAs in industry to serve the public markets to, uh, you know, solidify the integrity of those small business financial statements with creditors, lenders, um, and other stakeholders. And there is a disconnect between obtaining a licensure through public accounting, uh, which seems to be the typical path, but there is a need to go through the non-traditional path. And there is, a, there is um, also another disconnect in the code where if you require, if you obtain licensure through academia, you do not have to work under a C active licensed CPA. Um, so there, there's just a little bit of a bias of getting people to get licensed through working in public accounting. And as we know, more and more graduates want to they want to choose a different CPA path. They want to work on their own. They want to work, um, you know, remotely uh, in industry. So there just needs to be a little bit of thought into getting that experience requirement and lessen the um, compliance factor. You know, I, I understand the intent is for, you know, we don't want inexperienced CPAs out there, you know, doing tax returns and, and other CPA duties, but um, 
you know, someone in industry should be qualified to become a CPA if they haven't worked in public accounting. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much for your comments. It appears that your comments are not related to our current agenda item. Uh, please note board members are not allowed to act on any item not on today's agenda. You may provide your contact information to board staff and thank you for your comments. Okay, moving on there are, to. There are no further requests for public comment. Okay. Shall I close that feature? Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, yes, moderate, please close. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on to our next agenda item number four, discussion and possible action regarding the experiential learning concepts being considered by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy, also known as NASBA's Professional Licensure Task Force. I will turn it over to Ms. Center for a presentation. Thank you, Chair Lada. The purpose of this agenda item is to provide the board an opportunity to review and discuss NASBA's Professional Licensure Task Force exposure draft related to the concept of a structured professional program. Please note that this item contains the original materials and the supplemental memo with NASBA's slide deck sent on January 17th. Specifically, NASBA is asking state boards to respond to the question, do you believe that the task force should continue to focus its discussions on an equivalent path to licensure that defines a structured professional program that would qualify an individual for licensure as a CPA. The task force has been charged with considering new concepts for CPA licensure that could be incorporated into the Uniform Accountancy Act or UAA to update the current licensure model. NASBA indicated the task force is looking into these options because of the inability of firms to hire CPAs, a shortage of auditors, CPAs leaving public practice, and a shortage of new CPAs entering the marketplace. The task force created the following seven principles to guide their discussion and consideration. One, establish an equivalent pathway in the UAA. In other words, the potential new pathway would not replace the current um, degree plus 150 units and one year of experience, but would instead offer a pathway to those who have a bachelor's degree, but not the 150 units. Two, protect the public interest. Three, cost effective. Four, maintains rigor. Five, available to firms and businesses of all sizes. Six, defines minimum time frame to complete. Seven, establishes an evaluation process to assess completion of program. After discussion centered around the history of the current education model, the education required under mutual recognition agreements and the experience learn and earn pilot the task force agreed that a structured professional program should be explored. It is important to note that the structured professional program is different than the experience, learn, and earn option that is being piloted at Tulane University. While both address the additional requirements after gaining a bachelor's degree, the experience, learn, and earn option is done in collaboration with a university and results in a college transcript with 150 units while the structured professional program would be experiential learning completed under the direct supervision of a CPA and thus does not result in being granted college units. A structured professional program would be considered an alternate licensure pathway. With the addition of an experiential learning model, candidates for CPA licensure would have, as NASBA references, three options. One, complete a bachelor's degree in courses that satisfy the 150 education requirements, pass the CPA exam, and complete one year of accounting experience. Two, complete a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in accounting or tax, pass the CPA exam, and complete one year of accounting experience. Option three, this would be the new structured professional program or experiential learning option and would require applicants to complete a bachelor's degree, complete a structured professional program under the direct supervision of a CPA, 
pass the CPA exam and complete one year of accounting experience. 150 units would not be required under the experiential learning option. As you can see by the description, the only difference in the additional pathway is the replacement of the 30 units with a structured professional program. Staff attended a NASBA webinar on January 8th to hear more about the structured professional program. And it is clear there isn't yet a clear definition of the program or how it might impact the work of state boards. For example, it is unclear if NASBA state boards or a peer reviewer might be responsible for reviewing and pre-approving the, the firm developed programs. Additionally, it was clear that NASBA values mobility that substantial equivalency between jurisdictions allows and is concerned by the threats to such equivalency that exists when states go outside of the licensure models that exist within the UAA. The board is asked to respond to NASBA's question. Again, it is, do you believe that the task force should continue to focus its discussions on the equivalent path to licensure that defines a structured professional program that would qualify an individual for licensure as a CPA? Staff recommends that the board respond to the NASBA survey in the affirmative, but follow-up questions are recommended as part of the answer. Uh, these may include, and I have several I'll go ahead and, and provide to you. How does this proposed experiential model, model differ from the prior pathway used by many state boards, including California, that included a bachelor's degree and two years of experience? What additional pathways or concepts were considered and why were they discarded, if any? If the task force, um, is the task force limiting its consideration to only one model? How might the size of a given firm affect its ability to participate in a structured professional program? What are the logistics, or in other words, approving, monitoring, evaluating, et cetera, of implementing the structured professional program, and how might that workload be divided between NASA state boards and the uh, structured professional program provider? Will the program be limited to public accounting firms or include other options, such as military experience? Would the structured professional program be individualized based on the experience, education, and skills of the participant? So, for example, will the length of one of, of the program differ between a participant who has 120 semester units and one with 140 semester units? And the last question, will the focus of the competencies gained during the structured professional program be limited to accounting or will they include soft skills such as written and verbal skills? In addition to the questions that were included in the item as well as the supplement, the board may wish to convey a sense of urgency given initial analysis suggests that California would need to seek legislation to implement an additional pathway. This concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer member questions. Do I have any board member discussion? Any comments? Okay, I'll offer a few of my own. Um, largely in my view, uh, those 30 units make up 20% of that education requirement. And I don't think it diminishes the importance of the ed education at all. Uh, making that transition from academia to the workforce is, is a challenging one and it takes a candidate time to orient themselves from learning something in school to actually understanding the real world application and connecting those dots. And I think, you know, using that 30 units as experiential learning or a structured program would be definitely beneficial and help them develop skills um, in a faster manner and make that connection. So I think it's a positive thing. So my answer would be yes. And all of the questions staff has outlined, I think we should move forward with asking. Um, a couple questions I had is, 
of the military experience, do we know what that would entail or can we add a question about what that would entail? And non-accredited programs, I would be concerned about including that. Is that something we can inquire about? We are happy to add additional questions. Um, given the amount of information we receive, we're, we're really not able to answer questions about what is currently being considered and what isn't, but we can expand on the, the list of questions. Thank you. And I think I had one more question. Um, in regards to the 30 hours of CPA exam prep, um, being a potential option, I would definitely be interested in getting information about that. Um, that seems, I know the concern is measuring um, the competence after an individual would complete the 30 hours of the structured learning and that's already structured and I think would be an excellent way. So that's something I think was a great suggestion. Um, but those are all of my comments. Are there any public comments? Oh, Ms. Corgan. Thank you. I agree wholeheartedly with, with your comments and I have some of the same ones myself. Um, going back to what we spoke about in the prior agenda item, the accredited versus not. Um, and I don't know, um, part of that is in these pages aren't numbered, but in the slide that had to do with MRA education evaluation where they don't focus on accredited, um, it just seems, and I and I don't know why that is. I don't understand that. I'd like to understand that a little bit better. I, I'm just used to being associated with accredited universities myself, so maybe that's my limitation. I don't know, but there's no focus on that because somehow, at some level, a determination is made, maybe in mass or something, that an education requirement is met, and I don't quite know how they're, how they're doing that and how they plan to do that. Another one uh, was uh, um, bearing with me. I, I too did not, I do not know what military experience is. I feel silly asking. I fully support military, but I don't know how it must pertain to us in some way, the accounting world in some way. I don't know what it means. I mean, they're not specifying for-profit, non-profit government which we kind of assume, but now we have military, so so I, I kind of need to know that. There's also a place in here, I don't know if I can find it, um, with a structured program, that third option, where the 30, the 30, the additional 30 seemed to be flexible. I wish I could find the terminology that was bothering me, um, and I'm sorry, I don't know where it is. But it's almost like it was um, subject to the student's interpretation or something. I, I'm not locating it right now. Do you, do, you, do you have any idea where the page is, where those options are? Let me just take a second to go through it. I, I have it marked, but. Uh, Ms. Corrigan, oh, sorry. If, if you want me to respond. Um, Would you please, thank um, you. I, Unfortunately, I'm not exactly sure which page oh. uh, you're referring to. I will say, um, just in general, the webinar that we attended didn't really focus uh, uh, very deeply on any of the things you just spoke about. It really was focused more, um, at least in terms of what they presented and talked about, um, on, the, on the structured programs that would be developed by firms. And so because of that, I think there are a lot of questions about some of these other options that we see on the slides because they weren't presented in a way that, that answered those questions. So I think that's fair for us to look at these slides and call those ones out um, and, and maybe include those in that example list right now where we have military and maybe just add, add to that um, list. I can continue for just a moment. I, I actually found it. It's called Today's Model, 30 Credits, Experience, Learn, and Earn, the ELE, Experiential Learning. Then it says Flexible 30, Student Defined. I don't know what that means. I mean, yeah, that's right. what it says, but I'm, I'm not sure what the context of that is. Um, okay, Ms. Corrigan, uh, Mr. Franzella had a response to that. Oh, yes, thank you. 
believe that all that means is that the student is going back to school and selecting any courses they want to fill that 30 units, going back to community college or the like. It's not within the structure of, say, the PWC model, where there's probably some structure to that, uh, that learning. And then from the ELE, there's only certain classes you can pick that uh, fall into that model. The other ones are just students going back and they might have everything other than those 30 units and are just going back and taking classes, hopefully better broadening their uh, their horizons a bit, but could be going back and picking anything. Okay, thank you for that. And then as far as mentioning that it might include or may include uh, soft skills, in my opinion, the soft, well, we, we really want a definition of all that and how much would be included, because it's very important to know, you know, you know, attestation, accounting, attestation, taxation, soft skills, which are the written verbal skills, but are they really exercising, you know, knowledge of accounting standards, auditing standards, that sort of thing. Um, and I, I, I like the pre-approval and the periodic evaluation because I think with something that could vary so much between individual, I guess, uh, it, it would be important to have something like that. So I think that keeps some of that rigor and the structure in place. And um, knowing, I know, I'm told, NASBA, that these plans can, can and do, I guess, are working in other countries. So it'd be nice to understand what they're doing and how they're doing it and how it might apply to us. So if NASA, the nationals can take that all on, that's great. I, I'm fully supportive. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Corrigan. Mr. Jacobson. Thank you. So one of the reasons that I like the two-lane model is that there's a transcript at the at the end of the day. If the, the, these rather undefined things get get some sort of definition. It doesn't seem like they're going to translate into a transcript. So, someone at the uh, on the staff is going to have to make a judgment call as to whether uh, this is. Uh, a, a substantial equivalent to to the thirty units or not. Um, so therefore, I I, I think it, it's a, a good question would be to ask uh, how do we verify that there's a that 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 this uh, experiential uh, issue that uh, is uh, substantially equivalent to the thirty units. And to keep that in the, in the discussion, th that at the end of the day, someone has to uh, look at it, and I, 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 I'm not sure that's fair to to that someone or to the student who doesn't know who's looking at it. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Jacobson. Uh, Mr. Franzella has a response for that. Yeah, just at some high level, the term that they kept using during the um, the webinar, the the overview was a rubric of some model. I'm not really they hadn't defined what a rubric would be. There's a lot of discussion around the topics that you brought up, Ms. Corrigan, related to. It started with they would be more discipline related skills, but as the presentation went on, adding in soft skills into the rubric, and so right now that would eventually be what is the I guess the standard by which we would be evaluating if somebody's additional experiential learning through this model would meet the substantial equivalency of 150. And I agree with you that it leaves a lot right now at this stage to figure out how that would be assessed and whether or not it's individual specific. I think that's the reason one of the staff's question was, is that rubric scalable if somebody's short 10 units versus short 30 units? and how that would kind of interplay. But uh, according to the NASBA presenters, they will be, if this is being supported, they're going to be looking at a rubric at a national level that can be presented, but then it's up to the individual boards to determine whether or not that rubric is sufficient for your board, for the needs of your, the, the, the regulated community, the consumers, 
and the like. So then it becomes more of a board specific rubric at that particular point. And the scalability factor for firms uh, all become part of that discussion. So this rubric is really what I think is going to help at least start advancing the conversation as they start filling in what that may look like so we can understand how that interplays with the the 30 units after the fact. Thank you, Mr. Franzella. Ms. Ward, did you still have a comment? Um, I don't know if it's a comment or just maybe to help Ms. Corrigan. Um, I could be wrong, but the military experience could be where, I don't know for sure, but I know for hygiene, we have people who are in the military who are trained to be a hygienist, but they can't come out into the real world and practice it. So it's a transition of can the board accept it which is hard because we don't know the education. It doesn't match up. So I'm assuming that's what they're referring to, military experience. Someone may be in the military trained to do accounting. Now they're done, they want to come out, but hold on, you don't have what we have. I'm assuming, but I don't know. Thank you, Ms. Ward. Um, I just had a question or a comment about the soft skills just to um, piggyback on Ms. Corrigan's comment. Uh, I would like to also inquire about the proportion of that. If it were to be included, I think it is important to include it because especially me having started my career in auditing, you leave college, you think you're gonna be doing all this analytical stuff, math things, and that's not the case. Auditing is a very communication-based area. Um, written communication is extensive, documentation is extensive. You also need to have a very delicate balance with your clients while maintaining a positive interaction with them, you know, while also maintaining your independence. So it is very important to have good communication skills, I think, as a CPA. So I think that would be something great to include, but, you know, defining or asking what the parameters would be around including it, I think would be great. Do we have a motion? to proceed with, let's see here. Yes, Mr. Franzella, please. <laughs> so in order to respond on the board's behalf, we do need a motion. And really the, the primary motion initially is, do you want us to, does the board want us to respond in the affirmative to kind of let NASBA know that yes, we would like the pipeline task force to continue to explore this model. And staff believe that is, I mean, there's not a lot to go off of at this point. So yes is the appropriate answer. Um, and so staff are recommending yes. And then on top of that, you have the list of questions in the original material, the secondary material we've listened here and we'll update those questions um, or refine them within the questions we have here to ask those. And we would just like the board's approval to include those series of questions uh, back to NASBA so that they can have that as a base point as part of their discussions. Ms. Corgan? Yes. So I will move um, that we do that and consider, of course, what staff have already presented, the discussion items that we have had here. And I guess that would leave it to staff to work with board president to finalize that, that letter and submit it. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have a second? Ms. Thompson. I move to second the motion. Thank you. Any additional board member comments or questions? Seeing none, any public comment here in Sacramento? This is the moderator. If anyone would like to make a comment on the motion, you may look for the hand icon and click that to raise your hand, or you may click Excuse on Excuse me, Ms. Moderator. Uh, yes. We're not at that part yet. We're taking public comments in Sacramento first. My apologies. Uh, not Jason, a problem, Mr. Fox? Yeah, Jason Fox, the California side of CPA. Just, just a, a couple of um, comments related to the prior agenda, just hearing the conversation here. So we're, from Cal CPA standpoint, we're very much evaluating the same, you know, concepts we've been shared almost as much as it's been shared with some of the board leadership. So we're trying to evaluate that. I, I would, we would support the board's exploration and position on that. I, you know, I th think there is merit to kind of some blending of experience and education in some form. I don't know if this is the right mix or not, but it's worth continuing exploring. Um, some just additional questions or comments that might be considered for the board um, staff, you know, to consider following back to, to NASBA and share this with, with staff, but want to share with the board. Uh, who will determine the competency list for the SSP and or SPP and, and how? 
who will approve slash accredit the SPP program and use within the firms and how would that accreditation process play out? Um, who will assess the candidates for competency, uh, you know, to make sure that they've evaluated the, gone through that stuff, the SP, SPP and how would that process look? I think one of the questions that we have is, is there a time length for the SPP program? Is it, is it one year? Is it longer than one year? Is it a sliding scale depending on the candidate and as they move through the process? Um, and I think, you know, something that would be to, to consider is what is the cost implications to kind of implement this program? Cost to the board, the state board, you know, to have some process to this, uh, but cost to the candidate to, Go through that cost to the firm to have to create a system to you know implement this. I, I don't you know these are just questions that we have as we kind of look at that that might be worth you know consideration for your feedback to NASPA. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Any additional board comments? Um, I had a actually I have a question. Um, do we know if for a structured learning program? if that can also count towards the one year of experience or can we ask it does not okay um according to the little flow chart that they provided us um i don't believe i believe this is in addition to the one year because it's only replaces that 30 but i think that's a fair question to add Sorry about that, technical difficulties. Any additional uh, public comment here in Sacramento? Seeing none, moderator, please open WebEx for public comment. Kristen, I, I had a, a question, Dan Jacobson. Okay, sorry about that, moderator. Hold on one moment, Mr. That, Jacobson. Thank you very much. Actually, it's more of a, 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 a comment, if it's all right with, I, I believe this motion was made by Nancy. If it's all right with her, I, I would suggest that uh, Jason Fox's, uh, the ideas that he presented also uh, be considered in um, writing the questions uh, that are going to be written. Uh, Mr. Jacobson, or Ms. Corgan, let me know if you agree. In my view, uh, the questions Mr. Fox raised are encompassed in the questions that we've already have presented and um, staff can expand on that with the direction of the president. Would you agree? I do agree with that. Thank okay. you. Thank you. I, I Thank you so that. much, Mr. Jacobson. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ms. Center. Before we take the vote, uh, partly because I'm looking at our attorney and, and his face, um, would you mind if I read what I believe the motion is for the record? just because it was a little odd. Sure. Um, CPC recommends the uh, CBA delegate authority to the president uh, uh, to respond to the exposure draft in the affirmative, including questions to NASBA as included in the agenda materials and discussed during the public meeting. Yes. Okay, we have agreement. Any additional public comment in Sacramento since our additional board comments? Seeing none, moderator, now please open for public comment. Thank you. We have opened up the WebEx Q&A feature to facilitate public comment. If you'd like to make a comment on the motion, you may look for the hand icon and click that to raise your hand, or you may look for the question mark icon and click that. Type the word comment into the text box and click send. Are there any comments on the motion? Oh, and our call-in users may press star three to raise their hand. I do not see any requests for comment. Shall I close that feature? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Reed, please call for the vote. Evangeline Ward? Yes. Teresa Thompson? Yes. Christian Lotta? Yes. Dan Jacobson? Yes. Yes. And Nancy Corrigan? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Reed. So that concludes our committee for professional conduct meeting today. We are adjourned.